sugar good afternoon everyone hope you are keeping safe and staying healthy welcome to organ usa sustainability webinar we are very delighted to welcome you to, to today's webinar though we would wanted to host this in person and we are very glad to welcome you virtually today so this is our second webinar in the sustainability series of cotton usa so the first webinar we held was in february so the second webinar that we are holding today the topic for today's discussion is sustainability and transparency transforming the textile supply chains so today we have eminent speakers speaking from uk us and even hong kong so before we start the session today we would actually want to understand what our audience understands about sustainability or what your organizations think about sustainability so we would really appreciate if you can type in the chat box if there are any specific goals that your organization has kept for sustainability so i mean what do you think really about sustainability is sustainability only related to the fibers or is it going beyond fibers or is it covering something starting from the fiber and covering all the operations going to the consumer level so uh, who is really driving sustainability is it the consumers is it brand retailers or is it your own organizations who have kept the goals so that you can make your next generations in a better place or is it the governments or is it the strong regulations who are driving sustainability so last two years have been really very challenging for all of us we have seen a lot of changes in the prices we have seen a lot of changes in the supply and demand situation but one thing which has fairly remained constant is the goals for sustainability i mean there was a study which had been recently done by mit and the research shows that more than 80% of the respondents have kept the sustainability goals intact or or even they have increased their commitments towards sustainability so same thing can be told about india also uh, one of the things that we are most of the time worried is are our consumers going to pay for sustainability are they going to pay the premium or not so same thing if you see what has happened in india recently as we are seeing that electric vehicles are on the rage now so there was a study again which was done by one of the leading consultants in india to see are the consumers ready to pay premium for the electric vehicles and uh, for a surprise 90% of the consumers in india have said that yes they are ready to pay the premium so which means if you have a right product if you have a right sustainable product for your consumers the consumers are always there and ready so this is something that is for the current consumer so let's also talk about our future custom uh, future customers who are our kids i mean these days what has happened is all of us are staying at home so there is a lot of interaction that is happening between you know we are listening to what our kids are learning from their schools and that our kids are also hearing what you know we are presenting these days so i happened to actually listen to, uh, you know one of the uh, sessions from uh, the teacher of my kid today and the 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 the, uh, the study was about the waste and you know there was a 40 minute lecture only on the waste you know how we are handling the waste what is waste management so i was really surprised that the teachers are teaching the kids about the waste management and that two 40 minute session and one thing again which came up was how they are handling the uh, waste about textiles the kids grow every year so you know in hindi they asked ki i will tell in english after word ki aap kya karte ho jab aapke kapde chote ho jate hain agle saal ke liye aap wo fenk dete ho aap wo waste ko kaise handle karte ho and you know the kids were responding ki hamare parents to ek do size bada hi leke chalte hain taki wo agle do saal ke liye bhi use kar sake so i will translate it in english the kids were responding that their that their parents are buying clothes only which is one size more so that you know they are able to use it for next year so our consumers are really very active you know they, so so what we are going to see for the future is that you know really very very smart consumers uh, now uh, we have been hearing lot about carbon emissions and if you talk about europe europe specifically european union has taken a commitment that they are going to reduce their carbon emissions by 55% by 2030 compared to 1990 levels so there has been an increase in the commitment level earlier this was only 40% now it is 55% so what we are going to see is that the there is an increase in the commitment level when we talk of sustainability so so the, the new thing that we are also going to see probably is the measures that are going to support the sustainability drives so so i think you would have heard about cbam which is carbon border adjustment mechanism so this is a kind of a carbon tax 
so what we are going to see probably in europe is that the products that europe is importing which are carbon intensive we are probably going to see that there's going to be a carbon tax based on the carbon footprints and the price of that carbon is equivalent to what the european is, european companies are paying so that is something so that can also alter the business is in future so this is a transformation or you can say a, a disruption that you know which might happen which is you know not very far away from us so i think let's come back to textiles so what can you really expect from our today's session so first thing is definitely what you can learn from today's session is what brand retailers are thinking about sustainability how they are addressing the needs to source sustainable materials the other thing is you will have received an update on suprema india has been the one of the largest market for suprema and uh, today we are going to have speakers updating you about the suprema situation then you will also learn today how us cotton press protocol is addressing to the needs of sustainability and more importantly how the indian manufacturers can gain advantage by becoming a member of us cotton press protocol you will also receive new updates on the us cotton press protocol program and then Uh, how transparency is becoming one of the most important part of sustainability now before we really go to our first session i will want to also hear from you because today's session is more interactive we will have lots of uh, q and a we will have lots of polling questions so we also you know need to learn more from your side so before we go to our uh, uh, first uh, speaker i will want to understand we will want to understand from our participants you know what what category they represent are the mills manufacturers are the brand retailers or they lie into the other category so sumit if you can put the first polling question on board so that we can understand about our participants please if we can have first poll question so here is the first poll question for uh, our participants so what describes you best are you a mill manufacturer are you a brand retailer or if you are let's say machinery supplier or if you are a chemical supplier or you are a trade organization or you from academics so please click others and uh, for each poll question you will have around 35 seconds to 45 seconds uh, to respond to this so thank you very much uh, for uh, your response on the first question and uh, so yeah uh, i mean i have already asked you to define sustainability so throughout the session you can put your thoughts what you think about sustainability and this is little more subjective question so that we want to learn you know how you you or your organization really defines about sustainability so let's go to our first session so first speaker is sara lukman from uk she is a consultant for cotton council international and she is going to provide up their own us cotton trust protocol in india we already have 25 members who have joined the us cotton trust protocol program so tara is a sustainability program leader with a deep experience in apparel and sourcing she has held roles at esos.com and tesco plc spanning 15 years of environmental stewardship she is passionate about transforming the fashion industry with a track record for delivering change and fostering collaboration on the international platform tara led the esos product sustainability strategy beginning with raw materials so we are delighted to welcome you tara over to you tara please take it away thank you Thanks so much, Poosh, and good afternoon to you all. It's great to speak with you, especially in a region where we're so well supported. It's great to be amongst friends. Um, I know many of you are already quite familiar with the US Cotton Trust Protocol. Maybe you've seen some introductory materials previously. So I'm going to dive into some program news and updates, and then I'll be handing on to my colleague Gary Bell for a more detailed look at transparency. If you've not seen introductory materials explaining the trust protocol in more detail, please do reach out to Push after the session and we'll be pleased to set that up for you. Just as a reminder of our goals and objectives, we, we with the trust protocol are bringing quantifiable and verifiable goals and measurement to more sustainable cotton production, a key need for brands and retailers. We want to drive continuous measurable improvement in key sustainability metrics. And in do, doing so, we're providing the sustainability credentials of cotton that's grown in the US and meeting the needs of brands and retailers on robust sustainability data and value chain transparency for cotton. 
the US cotton industry as a whole is absolutely committed to continuous improvement and innovation in order to set a new standard in more sustainable cotton production. We set these goals back in uh, 2018 for achieving by 2025. And these are science-based goals. Um, we're looking to reduce our environmental footprint, footprint even further. And that is the work of the, that we will guide with the trust protocol getting progress against these goals. So what's new in the Trust Protocol? I want to share with you the progress we're making on engagement across the sector. The programme is really ramping up and as such we're constantly evolving the way that the programme works and the service it provides. So I have some updates for you on who is now involved, the cost to participate and how we're delivering on our promises of strong data and transparency for brands. So already um, in 2020, our growers have produced 10% of US cotton production, 1.5 million bales under the Trust Protocol programme, which gives us a great availability of eligible fibre for brands to uptake through the programme. And we're busy recruiting more growers into the programme this year and expect to double the fibre production to 3 million bales by the end of um, 2025. We're looking for 50% of US cotton produced in 2025 to be produced under the Trust Protocol. So a very rapid scale up uh, fibre availability with the support of all of our participants. And happily, the sector is really supporting us in the value chain. So we've signed up over 450 members of the textiles industry from uh, across uh, mills and manufacturers and brands to give us that confidence that we can scale up quickly and the demand for growers to participate is there. Some highlights on the brand participation. We have 45 large brands participating right now and Gary's going to talk to you about a little bit more about the, the activities that they're involved in. He's leading them in their early participation in the transparency programme. So real momentum building here with global brands um, and more in the pipeline to be announced as soon as we can. Um, and we're delighted to count sustainably minded brands like Gap, Levi's, Tesco's among our early adopters. It's interesting to understand the business case for brands in participation. It seems to be coming from two key priority needs. One is the need for validated sustainability data on raw materials in order that they can accurately report their environmental impacts and reductions. And the second is the need for supply chain transparency to enhance their work in other areas and make sure they can be confident in the country of origin of the cotton in their supply chain. So as you can see here, Gap have found a strong business case for trust protocol participation, very much in line with their corporate goals to address climate change and water use. Here is an update on our fee structure. Uh, just as an overview, this is how the structure is combined. I have some more detail for mills and manufacturers. Um, we've published our fees for participation and as we come on to talk about the way our transparency systems worked and our partnership with the Textile Genesis platform, there will also be some royalty fees applicable in the future for Textile Genesis. However, it's royalty free for mills and manufacturers up until January 2023. So there's a great opportunity to get involved in the next couple of years, uh, ramp up and have the system working well for your supply chain during that free period. Supply chain members um, can contribute $500 annually, which supports the administration of the credit system so that you can access it and we can track your US um, cotton on behalf of the claims that the brands would like to make. Um, and we'll continue to update you as soon as we have more details from Textile Genesis. But as I say, there's, a, there's quite a long free period for participating in their programme alongside uh, the other fibres that they're tracking in the supply chain. Let's take a look at the data outputs. So I've got some snapshots of the data we're collecting at farm level and how that's influenced by practices on the farm and then aggregated for everybody to use. So these are the data components we have. The data comes from a self-assessed information from the farmers on the practices at farm level. Uh, their input data on production stats and then the modeling tool from our metrics partner, Field to Market, 
And all of this is supported by a wraparound assurance program with Control Union to make sure the data is accurate and relevant. So let's have a look at then how farm practices are driving changes in these metrics. We can use um, carbon as an example of one of our metrics and see just how many different practices on the farm contribute to carbon emissions and therefore reduction. Soil conservation and carbon are really highly correlated. So practices like uh, conservation tillage contributes to both. That helps prevent soil erosion, supports water infiltration into the soil and helps in soil retention of organic matter. So as an example, we would be encouraging growers to construct wind breaks where we see high wind erosion, um, thus preserving the soil and its ability to store carbon. Uh, practices like crop rotation also contribute to biodiversity, adding to soil flora and fauna. So there's a whole web of uh, practices on the farm that are contributing towards the indicators, which gives you just a flavour of the uh, level of complexity of the data that we're collecting, um, but the level also of intelligence that we can play back to the farmer in order to help inform his decisions on better practices. give you an idea of the kind of data that then results as an output of the program and the work. Um, this is aggregated data from a pilot of the Trust Protocol in 2017, our early adopting farmers, before we launched it for other growers to participate. But it gives you a bit of insight into how the raw data we gather at farm level is used to calculate impacts. Um, so this group are showing progress against all of the target indicators and in fact in some cases have already hit the 2025 national goal, for instance, on soil conservation. We're in the process of harmonising all the national uh, indicators against our uh, farm results for 2020 right now. So we'll have our first aggregate results in the autumn for our large scale uh, uh, production for this year. So by aggregating this data against our uh, target indicators annually, we can provide brands with an accurate set of environmental indicators for the US cotton they source. And that in turn enables them to make stronger claims about the impact of their products and their sourcing. Now, the other big priority I mentioned was how the trust priority, uh, trust protocol provides its members with complete supply chain transparency through its protocol credit management system. Um, as you will know, the ability to validate the supply chain and the country of origin for the cotton has become a really pressing issue for brands globally. Uh, we've got a great solution here and we're underway in piloting it with several brands. So you might well be invited to participate if you supply one of those brands. The protocol credit management system is a powerful solution that harnesses the technology of both the trust protocol platform and the textile genesis platform together. So we recently announced our partnership with textile genesis um, and it's a platform already familiar to a number of brands and manufacturers joining together the solution for multiple sustainably produced raw materials. I won't speak any further on this solution because we've got the expert with us today and I'm shortly going to hand over to Gary Bell uh, to explain that system to you in greater depth. Before I finish, I just want to flag up some resources for you and we'll share all our materials following the session so that you'll have links to follow and so forth. Uh, we'd really uh, love to hear from you, so do get in touch. Uh, if you're considering joining the Trust Protocol, um, we have all the details you'll need on how to get involved, uh, further detail on uh, cost, um, participation requirements, how you're going to support your brand partners if you're involved in pilot activity and so forth. Um, so do dip into our website for some great resources and further depth information. We've got some great videos, farm level practice, um, and we'd very much like to hear from you. Uh, I will be available for Q&A afterwards together with Gary. That concludes my quick round of updates. Many thanks for your time just now, um, and I look forward to speaking with you shortly. Thank you, Tara, for, the, for your presentation now. And before we move on to our next presentation, may I please ask uh, Sumit to uh, put our next poll question, please? 
किया तो नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज हाउ फेमिलियर आर यू विद यूएस फॉर इंटरेस्ट आर यू वेरी फेमिलियर आर यू समर फेमिलियर और यू आर टोटली अनफेमिलियर अबाउट दिस We have a couple of more seconds to respond. And uh, yeah, so that's that's it. Uh, I think we have received a lot of responses. So, Sumit, so maybe if you can uh, display. So we have thirteen uh, percent saying we are very familiar. Some were familiar, forty-four percent. So that makes like. Uh, more than 57% who are familiar uh, with US court interest. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. So we can uh, close the uh, poll results. So yes, now we move on to our next session. And this is a very interesting session uh, from Gary Bell. And uh, so as you all know that, uh, uh, you know, at uh, US, we have been using the technology. Technology has always been a forefront, be it farm practices, be it improvements in the quality. And now it's developing the unique platform for the protocol credit management system for the trust protocol program. So today we are delighted to welcome Mr. Gary Bell. And uh, so Gary is the consultant for Cotton Council International. Gary has more than 30 years of senior experience in global textile and apparel industry. He is committed to driving operational excellence and strong results across the full spectrum of business processes from raw materials to front-end marketing and sales strategies. Passionate about sustainability, social responsibility and the role companies need to play moving towards a more sustainable future. So let's please welcome Gary Bell. He has been the brain behind the setting up all this protocol. So over to you, Gary, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, good morning from my part. Good afternoon, good evening for, for all of you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you today about the protocol and the protocol credit management system. So the um, as Tara and uh, Push both alluded to, we're at a very exciting time. Um, I think that the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol initially had a vision for what was going to occur in terms of capturing data at the farm level and the robustness of the program that the teams have built in relation to not only the capture of the data, but then the, the management and communication and the sharing of data, I think has been um, exemplary. Uh, obviously facilitated by the highly mechanized, highly advanced nature of the U.S. cotton farms uh, and U.S. cotton farmers. Some of the conversations that we're having on that front are, are extremely exciting. We're, um, you know, engaging with companies like John Deere, talking about actually capturing data coming directly off the, the machines as they're going through the field. So as, as Push uh, alluded to, technology is a very big friend of cotton, and it can be. Um, you know, we as, as participants or as, uh, as people that are presenting, we don't get a chance to take part in the, in the polls, but, you know, technology plays a very, very vital role in, in a sustainable future, whether it's from a manufacturing point of view, whether it's from a consumer point of view. And quite honestly, the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol in our partnership or selection of textile genesis, we've taken the concept of connecting that data that's coming from the farm level all the way through the entire supply chain to a completely new level. And that's, I think, what has created such interest from our brand partners. And it's what's also enabled many of the mill manufacturers that have already had exposure to the system to really understand that this is a vital asset that you can, in fact, engage with in order to position yourself as being part of a truly sustainable supply chain. So the, um, sorry. So as Tara touched on, you know, the U.S. Cotton Trust uh, Protocol, our, our goals are really related on two fronts. So it's related to the sustainability aspect of what's happening at the farm level. Uh, we're capturing and recording data from 100% of the participating growers. So as she touched on, 1.5 million bales in last year's crop from about 310, 312 growers. We're looking to take that number to, 300, to 750 growers for the upcoming crop year. And we'll be recording on six key sustainability metrics. And if anyone on the call has any specific questions related to the data itself, related to the methodologies that are being used to calculate those metrics, we have all of that available to you as well. 
Some of that is available at trustuscotton.org at the website. And then the second aspect of what we're delivering, which is really where I've, where I've come in, um, given the experience that I had throughout the supply chain, is really on the concept of transparency. So it's providing brands and retailers the ability to track the consumption of US cotton throughout the entire supply chain. And we're doing that, again, with the partnership with Textile Genesis, by tracking and capturing article level transactions throughout the entire supply chain of products and materials that are consuming US cotton. Um, the one question which we do frequently get relates back to data privacy and confidentiality. So internally within our own systems and on the textile genesis platform, we have built in extremely robust um, data privacy and confidentiality protocols. Um, the practices that are used, the way that the servers are secured, the encryption that's being used throughout the entire process is, is quite robust. Again, if any of you have any questions specifically related to that, we can also provide that in, uh, in a larger material package. So Tara talked about the data. One of the um, you know, points is that this data is coming from the growers themselves. So when she spoke of the questionnaire, uh, that's something that if you are interested, we can provide to you. It's 124 questions. 40% of the questions represent required practices to which the only answer that the grower can in fact provide is to say, yes, I am in compliance with that particular practice. Um, that can be things with uh, relation to uh, chemical management. It could be in relation to uh, some of the regulatory requirements under the US DA protocols and uh, the US EPA, so the Environmental Protection Agency. And then there's uh, the balance of the questions are all recommended practices. So there are practices that the US cotton industry over its past 20 some years of driving towards more sustainable practices has recognized that specific practices, conservation tillage, uh, low drip irrigation systems, um, the notion of using cover crops and of rotating the crops in the field, that all of these practices deliver benefits to many of the individual metrics that we're reporting on. So as, as Tara alluded to, there is a direct correlation and sometimes an indirect correlation between a specific practice and the environmental outcome. The other part of the aspect for the growers themselves that they need to complete is once they've actually harvested, they're submitting input data. So specifically the number of passes that they've done through the field, the volume of materials that they've put onto the fields and quite a few other specific data inputs. Those are going into the field to market field print calculator, which is a, a third party. It's an agri ag ag agronomy based uh, scientific tool that it's not only applicable to cotton, it's actually applied to nine other row crops in the United States. And it's gone through an extensive peer review process over the years. So field to market takes uh, several data points and creates models that in fact generate those individual metrics that we'll be replying or that we'll be providing to, uh, to the market. And then the very last thing the grower needs to do is, is sign a certificate of compliance that basically asserts that everything that they put into the, uh, in, into the questionnaire and into the data inputs, in fact, is real and accurate. Um, the US Cotton Trust Protocol is asked frequently, are you the same type of a program as a mass balance program? And our answer to that question is no, but a little bit. So that sounds like a little confusing answer, but the, you know, the difference between our program and let's say something like a BCI program is that we're tracking through the, piece, the protocol credit management system transactions at every level within the mill and supply chains of these brands and retailers using blockchain technology. So actual articles are being recorded in the system, inventory ledgers are being kept at each one of the participating mills with inbound receipt of inventory and outbound shipment of goods. Uh, deducting inventories and maintaining an ongoing continuous inventory. The verification part happens with respect to the system itself, and I'll touch on that in a couple of slides. Where we mirror in the interim or in the short term, the mass balance system is in the concept of equivalency. So for those of you who are familiar with the BCI system, credits within our system do not move along the supply chain. So a credit is minted when a protocol grower's bale is harvested at the very beginning of the process. And then the credits stay in the protocol bank and do not transfer to anyone until they transfer to the brand at the very end of the process. So for those of you that are on the call that are mills or manufacturers involved in that process, you never need to worry 
about whether or not you have protocol credits or whether or not your supplier has protocol credits for you to buy along with either the fiber or the yarns or the fabrics. The only thing you need to worry about within the system is consuming products that are made with US cotton and that that transaction to you and the trans transaction from you has been captured in the protocol credit management system. So that'll become a little bit clearer in a few slides. So, you know, we are allowing the consumption of any US cotton that has been captured in the system into a product for the brand. And at the very end, that, pro that brand can make protocol credit claims against that product. So that's where we mirror the, the mass balance type scenario. In the interim, we are actually gonna be tracking the physical cotton that came off of the protocol growers fields. We call that protocol verified cotton, as opposed to any US cotton that goes through the system is called protocol eligible cotton. So if you have specific brands that you're supplying that are saying, I don't want the equivalent cotton, I want the actual protocol verified cotton that came off of that farm. The system is designed to be able to, accom to accommodate that. The challenge is that on the 1.5 million bales that were harvested last year and the 3 million bales that we're hoping to harvest this year, that represents a small percentage of the total US cotton crop. So as a yarn mill or as a fabric mill trying to buy yarn made with this specific protocol verified fiber, there might not be enough of it available to you or because it's in such limited supply, it might be quite expensive for you to buy just because of the nature of the commodity pricing. So I can get into more uh, details on that during the Q&A period if, if you would like. So our solution is really one solution that rests on two technology platforms. So the protocol platform was built by a third party service and technology provider based in the US called The Seam. And that particular platform captures all of the grower questionnaires, all of the field to market data inputs, everything that's happening on the farm and the brands themselves, that is where the brand will go and manage their protocol account. That's where they'll put in their forecasts for the total amount of cotton they'll use, the total amount of protocol credits they're gonna be claiming. That's where they'll put in their individual claims, et cetera. As mill manufacturers and the brand operations teams that are actually managing vendors and that are placing purchase orders, they will only ever engage or you will only ever engage with the textile genesis system. Um, and that's something that we can, we'll be diving into a little bit further detail. So the transactions that are being recorded are being recorded on the textile genesis system um, under a very secure blockchain technology. So the credits that I keep talking to, or I keep referring to, basically we use blockchain to convert one kilogram or every kilogram of protocol verified cotton. Again, that's the cotton that came off the protocol growers farm. And we convert that into a protocol credit. Every protocol credit is numbered with a unique identification number that links it back to the original, pro, uh, the original uh, permanent bale identification number of the bale and connects it back to the actual grower. So at the end of the year, when a brand actually receives and, and is claimed uh, 10,000 metric tons of protocol credits, if they wanted to know which farmer specifically generated those credits on their farm, we would be able to tell them that information. So we have very robust, unbroken blockchain transaction capture happening within the system. And the system itself, including the protocol platform and the textile genesis system, so the overall protocol credit management system, is using blockchain to track the movement and transactions at every stage of the process. So when the grower first ships his cotton through the gin to a cotton merchant, we're capturing that. We're validating the authentication of the uh, origin of the US cotton by verifying every single PBI number that's being captured in the system and uploaded in the system. Those PBI numbers are being verified to ensure that they're a legitimate PBI number, that they're associated with a specific crop year, and that they have not been duplicated, they have not been used before. So our entry point into the protocol credit management system, the first shipment in of fiber to the yarn spinner, we have absolute assurance that that's been validated and authenticated against the USDA database of eligible PBIs for that crop year. And downstream from that, all of the transactions between the yarn spinner, the textile member, the garment member, and the brand, um, we're requiring those, those transactions to be recorded in the system. And that provides the brand with a very clear, um, very clear view of who's been involved in the specific products. 
So as a mill within the system, there's three acts or three steps in your process. So if we think specifically that the image that's being shown right now is of a yarn spinning mill. If you're a yarn spinner, the first step is that you're gonna create protocol eligible articles. So if you currently within your systems have yarn skews or yarn articles that you've created that refer to just cotton as a generic cotton form, um, those actually would not be applicable here. You would need to create a yarn article that specifically identifies that this yarn, which I'm going to be transacting on and recording in the protocol system, contains US cotton. So US underscore cotton is a specific naming convention that we ask you to use. The textile genesis system makes this process extremely simple and um, in a set subsequent meeting if, if or information session, if you would like to see exactly how that works, we can show that to you. Um, we're in the process of doing that right now with uh, mills for four uh, rather large global brands that are running pilot trials with us. And uh, the process is relatively seamless. The second step in the process for a supply chain participant is that you have to record the shipment of those articles that you created. So you created a yarn that's identified as containing US cotton. You now actually, when you ship that to a fabric mill, you would record that sale or shipment in the protocol credit management system. This is done through automated uploads. You have a choice of doing an individual transaction one at a time, entering the data into a web, uh, web form. Or the other way to do it is we provide you with a template that uh, is an Excel spreadsheet that has a very specific format. And you just simply extract the information from your system. If you do it in the upload format, you can do it once a week. So you can actually record multiple shipments to multiple customers um, by just doing one extract, timing it maybe every Friday evening uh, so that you tell us all of the US cotton that you've sold to other members of the protocol during that week. And the last part of it is the one that's actually proving to be very, very important, <clears throat> excuse me, proving to be very important with the tightening regulations around importing and, and uh, customs and brokerage or customs and border protection services, specifically in the US, but also in the UK and, and now uh, increasingly in Canada and Australia and with the potential of legislation coming through in Europe. It's this concept of actually providing documentation. So we will be asking you after you've recorded a shipment to upload the commercial invoices, which we will ask you specifically to cover up the pricing. We do not want to see pricing. Um, it's not necessary for us. We just need to have documented proof that the actual title or ownership of the goods has been transferred to your customer. And then shipping bills, which basically asserts that in fact, the shipment occurred. Um, if any of you have been involved in a brand trying to put goods through and ship goods into the United States, um, you're probably familiar with the type of documentation US Customs and Border Protection Services is asking for. And that's what we're looking to capture here. All of this data, it's very, very important for me to make this point. I'm gonna make it again later on. None of this specific data related to individual transactions within the system, none of that will be visible to anyone but you and the protocol system. So the brand and retailer will never be able to see the actual quantity of materials that were shipped from you to your customer. They will never be able to see the quantity or price or any data related to the specifics of the shipment that your supplier shipped you. All they will know when they get to their traceability map will be that you were involved in the process. The two verification steps that I spoke of are related to uh, one, checking inventory. So again, if we think about the, um, the example of a yarn mill. So if you create an article that says that you are consuming 100% US cotton and that you try and record a shipment in the system of 10,000 kilos of that yarn, the system will check to see whether or not you had enough protocol eligible fiber to in fact be able to make that shipment. So if it's a yarn that has a 10% waste factor and you're trying to ship 10,000 kilos of it, in rough math, the system would say, do you have 11,000 kilos of fiber in your protocol account before you tried to make that transaction? And if you did, it would allow the transaction to go through. If you did not, you would receive an error message from the system saying you don't have enough eligible raw material to be able to ship that 10,000 kilos of yarn. And the same, the same type of process happens for shipment of yarn to fabric, of shipment of fabric to garments. 
The second aspect of verification happens when we look at those documents. So if you have said specifically that you are shipping to company XYZ, the documents that you upload will have to show that you've made a shipment to company XYZ. If you said that you shipped two specific yarn articles, the invoices and the shipping bills will need to show that you shipped those two yarn articles. With respect to the quantities, that's where there will be a little bit of, of play. So if you ship 10,000 kilos um, that you wanna record in the system because that's what your fabric vendor has asked you to do, but the actual shipment itself was for 15,000 kilos, as long as the volumes that are on the documents are greater than or equal to the volumes that you've recorded in the system, that would be approved. If you try and ship 10,000 kilos of a yarn but you provide a document that says that only 5,000 kilos of yarn were shipped, that's where you would receive an error message and someone would be contacting you and saying, it doesn't look like this transaction actually aligns with the documents you've provided. Um, at the end of the whole process, so when the brand and retailer receives their shipment of goods from the garment mill, the system will calculate how many protocol credits each one of those specific products is eligible to claim. The brand would then make their protocol claim, which would take that environmental data that we have talked to you about capturing, and it would assign a portion of it to that brand. So every one of the metrics that uh, Tara showed you, as those metrics are delivered to the brand, we'll be providing those in a per kilo of fiber number. So if the brand consumes during the course of a year or in a specific shipment, if the brand has received 10,000 kilos of a specific uh, product, 10,000 kilos are the consumed of our fiber, then essentially they would be eligible to 10,000 times whatever that number that we will have provided will be. And the critical part here, and this I, I can't emphasize this enough either, is the whole purpose of all of this is so that the brands can in fact make legitimate, um, reliable and verifiable sustainability claims to either their customers, to their shareholders, to their investors, to their own employees. And it's only through giving the brands that data, it's by connecting the data with the transparency system and allowing a brand to make sustainability claims. That's how we drive value back down through the supply chain. Right now, brands are in a very, very difficult situation where in order for them to actually purchase sustainable products, to purchase sustainable fibers in those products, they're paying a premium, but because they don't have and they have yet to really have a legitimate large scale way of being able to connect environmental data back through to that finished product and communicate that to a consumer, it's very hard for them to charge that extra money for those more sustainable products. So we're connecting the dots and in a simplified manner, my, my entire career of over 30 years was spent trying to figure out ways to actually tell the sustainability story to either shareholders, investors, employees, or consumers. And I'm, I'm ecstatic about the fact that we're creating that connection between data and what a consumer can see and what a consumer can hear and what stakeholders can hear. And the important part for you as a supply chain member is that you're contributing to that solution, which will allow the brand to recognize that what you're doing as part of that supply chain can be in fact compensated for. So you can in fact gain some of the value and cover some of the costs that are incurred as a result of trying to drive more sustainability through your business. So at the brand themselves, the way the protocol credit management system works is every individual product that they receive will basically generate a traceability map for that product. And this again is gonna to touch on that point of data confidentiality. So the brand will know when they receive a certain shipment of let's say 10,000 pairs of jeans, they will know the garment mill that made the jeans. They will know the textile mill or mills. If there's more than one, there'll be two of them showing on the map that made those fat, the fabric that went into those jeans. They will know the yarn spinner that made the yarns that went into the fabrics that went into the, the products. And they'll know the origin, the authenticated US cotton origin. The only thing that they will know is that the volumes that each one of these transactions occurred at and the amount that was shipped was enough to allow the very end 10,000 pairs of jeans to be made. 
They will not see anything related to any of these transactions. The only thing they will see is the name and the location of the mill that actually produced these goods. Um, I'm not sure on the call because they didn't see the, the makeup of the roles that each of you play. If there are traders or agents involved, so if you are a trader, you buy yarn from a yarn spinning mill and you sell it to fabric mills, you will need to be part of this transparency solution. You'll need to record and, and act as if you are a mill. But on this traceability map, your identity will not show up. So what the brands want on this traceability map is where conversions have actually occurred, not where all of the transactions. But in order to provide the brand with that unbroken chain of custody, you, de you do need to actually be part of this process. The other question which we're asked regularly is if I'm just a commission dye house, so I don't actually own the fabric, I just receive fabric to, to, to dye, and then I send it to the fabric mill that then sells it, if you're a commissioner, if you're a commission knitter, a commission dyer, a commission garment maker, you do not need to be part of the process at this time. We're looking at a way to be able to incorporate that. Brands have asked us to find a way to incorporate that. It's a little tricky in terms of the chain of custody transactions because that commissioned actor never in fact owns the material. So there's never an invoice um, or a purchase order. So at the end, that essentially ends my session. So I'll stop sh sharing my screen. Um, I thank you all very much. It's, there's a lot of detail that was covered in this, in this 20, 25 minutes, um, but we're more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Gary, uh, very much for this presentation. Uh, especially our uh, USCTV members will be very beneficial because they had a lot of questions like mass balance and they use existing patterns. So this is very helpful. So before we actually move on to Q and A, we have another poll question for uh, our participants. So uh, Sumit, if you can please put the next poll question, please. So according to you, is transparency a must for a supply chain, textile supply, sustainable textile supply chains? So do you agree with this statement, or you neither agree or disagree with this statement? You are neutral on this, or uh, you disagree with this statement? So according to you, is transparency a must for sustainable textile supply chains? Couple of more seconds to answer. Thank you. Thanks for your response. So let's see the results now. So if you can please display the results. So yes, so that's it, Gary. More, I think close to 90% of the respondents have said that yes, transparency is a must for sustainable supply chain. So that's pretty much, which means, you know, as the US Cotton Trust Protocol, our program is spot on uh, for the sustainable program. So I think now is the time to handle the questions. So Tara, let's, uh, if you can uh, be live again on the screen and uh, so we can all address the questions that we have been receiving. Uh, so the first question is for you, Gary. And the question is, uh, there is a USCTP member and they already have US cotton with them. So can they already use that cotton for uh, the program uh, for, and for any future US cotton test protocol program? So, so Push, uh, and I think that question came from, actually, I'll just go ahead and answer the question. Yeah, that, um, is, from Nitin, that is from Nitin Spinners, actually. They are actually a US Cotton Press Protocol member already. Yeah. That's, that's, a, so, that's a textile mill, that's a textile mill, a member, so, Spinner. So the answer to the question is yes. Um, there is a mechanism within which you can actually make the current existing fiber that you have um, eligible within the system. If you remember, every single shipment from a merchant to a yarn spinner in our system is being captured and the PBI number of that actual bale is being validated against the USDA. So the process for a yarn mill to make their current inventory eligible would involve you having to provide us with a list of all of the PBI numbers of every bale that you're wanting to make eligible and that we would be able to take that list and validate it against the USDA PBI uh, database. So yes, there is a process within which you can do that. 
again, in order to keep integrity of the system, if you are a fabric mill and you have fabric that was made from yarns that were made from US cotton, you would not be able to provide us with a packing list of the actual PBI numbers in your name, in your company name. So the only ones in the system that can actually make their yarn eligible or their fiber eligible is the direct recipient that has a packing list with your company name on it to show that you are one of the counterparties to that transaction. So I hope that's that, that's clear. Thank you very much, Gary. I think that's, that's pretty much clear uh, to all the members probably now. So I think that the, the other question, uh, Gary, is uh, uh, there is a question where, you know, where the mills wants to ask, is this program of US Cotton Trust Protocol different than USDA National Organic Program, NOP program, that's called. So is this different than the USDA NOP program? Yeah, look, the, the protocol is a, is a sustainability program that's, it's like a sust sustainability management program. So within our realm of 300 plus growers from last year and within our realm of 700 plus growers next year, there's organic cotton growers, there's conventional cotton growers, we have long staple fiber growers or ELS or Supima growers, we have upland uh, cotton growers. So, you know, the difference between an organic fiber and a conventionally grown fiber, um, our solution is really agnostic. Uh, so it, it can apply. So it runs, I guess, the answer to the question would be it's in parallel to, to that program. Um, but, you know, it, it, we, we have organic cotton that's flowing through our process the same way as, as, as we have conventional cotton. Thanks, Gary. And uh, the other question, uh, Gary, is, you know, again, I'm asking <laughs> too many questions on this, but yes. So there is a mill who is, let's say, a Supima certified mill. And uh, so they still have to sign on U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol program, even if they are Supima certified. So you think it's, they will have to be a member to be a part of this program? Yeah, there's two, two steps that every mill that needs to or that wants to be part of this solution for their brand and retail customers. Um, and the first is that they have to be a U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol member. So they, they, contact, they contact you and, or they go to trustuscotton.org and they, and they go through the enrollment process. The enrollment process takes maybe five minutes. So it's really, really short. The second step in order to actually be active and be able to record things in the, in the system and record transactions and, and make yourself part of this solution um, is in fact, you have to register at Textile Genesis. So you have to enroll in the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol and you have to register on the Textile Genesis system. Uh, that again, we can provide you with a, with a link um, on how to go about that. It, again, it's a very, very relatively simple process. Um, and yeah, once you've done both of those, even if you are a current Supima authorized vendor, yes, you need to go through, through that process. Thanks, Gary. Uh, the next question is for you, Tara, because you're working very closely with the brand retailers. So this is mainly coming from the uh, Trust Protocol members, uh, fabric manufacturers or the spinners. So when we can really, you know, expect to become, you know, active or when is the, uh, the platform going to be live or, you know, when they can really use the platform or how can they really participate as a pilot project or when are the pilot projects starting with the brand retailers? So this all is related to, you know, how to bring them into action. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing to say is that it will be led by the brand. So if you are trading with a brand who has joined the trust protocol, then you need to get ready, of course, then get in touch with us and we'll get you enrolled um, and get you a timeline for different activities to be involved in any pilot activity that the brand, uh, but you don't have to wait for that. Of course, you can join up as partner members now and promote that to your brand so that they know they can work with you on trust protocol cotton. Gary, I don't know if you want to add anything in terms of time scales for brand, for mills who have joined that when might they want to be ready for doing actual yeah. activities in terms of tracking. Yeah, Tara, I, can, I can add to that. So we have four global brands right now that are in fact in pilot phase. They will be done by the end of, probably the end of August actually. So it'll be relatively quick. We have another 10 to 15 brands that will start pilots in the middle of August and be done by the end of the year. So all of those brands, by the time we get into January of 2022, will be in fact what's, what's called a scale-up mode. So initially when a brand's in pilot mode, they'll invite 15 to 20 mill manufacturers in their supply chain to take part in testing the system. Once they go into scaling mode, um, then it's, you're talking about hundreds, if not, if not thousands of mills. 
So for some of the very large global brands, Gap being one of them that's in this pilot. So Target Corporation is in this pilot. Um, Levi's is in the pilot as well as uh, Next, so a British retailer. And, you know, as we see those, those supply chains expand, that's where you'll receive an invitation from the brand saying, look, as a valued partner to us, we would love for you to actually be part of this process. Um, we as a brand are looking for this. Um, and, you know, the important part from a brand perspective is I think brands for a long time have been looking for traceability of their supply chain and transparency into their supply chain. Obviously, every brand, you know, almost every brand has commitments towards sustainable practices and su sustainability within their business. And what this solution is doing is it's basically providing them both in one single solution. One thing to emphasize with respect to the textile genesis aspect, and Poosh, I think you touched on this, or Tara might have touched on this, <clears throat> this solution is not exclusively for U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol. So the solution is currently actually being, being launched or being uh, adopted by several man-made cellulosic fiber vendors. So Lensing Corporation is at the beginning of that, um, but there's also several Asian man-made cellulosic, so, so any rayons, uh, viscose. 80% um, 80, 80 of the world's recycled polyester uh, manufacturers are in fact on the textile genesis platform in the process of launching that. Um, there's uh, several other responsible fibers, responsible wool. Um, there's uh, some of the new regenerated uh, cottons. There's a recycled cotton out of Arvin that's actually up on Arvin Mills. It's actually up on this, this platform now in trialing phase. So while we're asking you to learn as you, as you join this system, we're asking you to learn a new, a, new, a new tool, a new platform if you want. The applicability of this platform and the, the value of this platform is that it will position you with brands on being a key partner that can service multiple sustainable fibers. So it's not just US cotton, it's not just a tool you're only gonna use for our program, it's a tool that you're gonna basically use and deploy for pretty much every sustainable fiber. Um, Push, there has been a couple of questions that I noticed in the in the chat, which actually I'll, I'll just address in one fell swoop because I think many go of them are related. <laughs> go, go ahead. That's, go the ahead. Concept, that, that's the concept of, I, I refer to it as forensic verification. So how are we going to actually find a way to make sure that what's being recorded in the system matches what's happening in the physical world? Um, for the time being, essentially, that will be done through a commitment that the mills that are signing into the program will be basically bound to being factual and as accurate as they possibly can. And what they record represents what's happening in the physical world. We actually envision that by the middle of 2022, we'll be adding forensic verification to this process. So if a brand selects to have the supply chain verified at a forensic level, there will be a process within which a third party will go into the yarn mill ask for fabric, ask for yarn samples and test that yarn. Same thing for the fabric, same thing for the, um, for the garments. If the folks that are asking a question are familiar with the e-lensing program, essentially it will mirror very similar to what lensing is doing with their e-lensing certification program or what Reprieve Unify, the manufacturers of recycled poly called Reprieve, what they're doing. So it'll be random auditing being done throughout the supply chain to try and ensure that the physical meets what, what the digital is, is being recorded. Um, so I think that there's quite a few questions that are kind of related yeah. around. Yeah, I think there are, there's still a lot of questions, but I think Gary, we will ask you again in the next time at our next webinar because we, because we are spending short of time. And yeah. Uh, yeah, we have to actually, you know, move on to the next session, but you know, very helpful what you have said, probably it's going to be a game changer in the future exactly to the needs of sustainability. So, so thank you very much, Gary and uh, Tara for being with us today. And with this, uh, we will now move on to our next session. And uh, so before we have our next speaker, uh, we have another polling question. So Sumit, if you can put that polling question for us, please. Yeah, the question here is, uh, would you like to be contacted by Cotton USA representative to become a US Cotton Trust Protocol member? So if you're already a member, just click already a member. Otherwise, yes, no, or probably it's not applicable to you because you will not be, you know, be a active participant of this uh, US Cotton Trust program. And in case we are not able to answer to your queries, we are seeing you questions and probably we will have your email IDs and we will get back to you with the written responses later on. Because, you know, we are also getting a little bit uh, short of time today. 
Yeah, so a couple of uh, seconds uh, more to be responded. Yeah, so yeah, there we go. So once again, thanks to Gary and uh, thanks Tara uh, for being with us today. Cheers, have a good day. So let's uh, have a next speaker on board and the next speaker is uh, Jane Singer. Uh, so she's going to speak uh, how global consumers raise the bar for sustainability, what they want and how manufacturers can deliver this. So to introduce Jane Singer, she is the director and head of marketing intelligence at Insight Fashion, one of the leading marketing intelligence publication for the global fashion industry. She also leads the market research team at GDT Research Limited, renowned for its breakthrough insights into consumer attitudes about fashion and lifestyle. Ms. Singer is a graduate of Vasa College with a degree in economics. She has over 20 years of experience in international markets with extensive experience in Asia. Ms. Singer is a featured expert speaker at a prom prominent trade fairs and industry events around the world. She also serves as a consultant to several leading apparel and textile companies, helping them to gain clearer insights into key markets and, ident and identifying new opportunities. So over to you, Jane. Can we have your presentation, please? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, okay. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I hope everyone can see my screen. Are you able to see the screen? So I want to thank you, first of all, to Push and everybody at CCI for inviting me to join this excellent event. I'm thrilled to be here and to be able to connect with all the great people in India. Um, I'm so excited to be able to share some of the insights that me and my team have learned um, as we're talking to buyers and also consumers in the market, and also to point out the big opportunities right now for Indian suppliers. So let's get started. Um, if we're looking at today, there's a new era, right? We might say it's the post-pandemic era or soon to be the post-pandemic era. Um, there's new opportunities and there's new challenges. So summing up some of the challenges, sustainability has become a top priority. It used to be something that people sort of wanted to have, but now it's a priority. It is a must have. We also see in the market, particularly at the consumer level, we see a lack of trust. So people want to go beyond, okay, what are, your, what are you saying about your product? They want proof. You have to prove what you're claiming. There's also heightened um, scrutiny of supply chains. There's a higher demand for transparency. And also nowadays, certainly since the pandemic, buyers have realized that resilience and reliability are as important as price. So as we all know previously, everything ultimately came down to price. And now people are realizing that getting a cheap price but not being able to ultimately get the product in the store um, could be a problem. And likewise, having issues, right, with sustainability or compliance issues can also be a problem. So consumers want quality. I know that a lot of people think that consumers only want something that's cheap and trendy and they don't care. But we have actually done rather exhaustive studies where we have in their own words what they want and increasingly people want quality. Um, the surge in e-commerce has provided consumers with even more choice. It used to be you could only get what was available in stores near you. No longer. You can go online and you can get stuff from anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. And consumers are also investing in better quality. What do I mean by that? I mean, they're willing to spend a little bit more to get something that's good quality, but they have to believe that what they're getting is better quality. Um, sustainability, right, is an expectation. Consumers no longer think, gee, wouldn't that be nice to have? Nowadays, they think it better be sustainable. It's just, it's just assumed that it'll be made sustainably. Um, consumers are also willing to try new brands. So before, if you were a big brand, you had that big advantage. Not anymore. Consumers are willing to try something that it's new. They didn't really hear of it, but they think it looks nice. And especially if they can see it in person, um, they feel good about it. So 
I think these are things that we need to take into consideration. So how do we define quality? We talk about quality, but how do we define it from a consumer's point of view? Consumers will tell you because they don't know the technical terms, right? Like we do. So consumers are going to sit there and tell you when you ask them, well, what do you mean by quality? They'll tell you durable materials, soft hand feel, sustainable, good workmanship, and unique design. So that might be a little different from the way that we would define quality, but we have to really be looking at it uh, from sort of what you might call a bottom-up point of view. Because ultimately, we have to make the kind of things that the consumer wants and that resonates with them, because if they don't buy it, then nothing else really matters. Brands are faced much more complex challenges than ever before. When I talk to buyers, wow, I mean, they're just scratching their heads as to what to do next. Um, they need to find materials that are sustainable, right? We've talked about that, but they also have to be fashionable. I mean, you can say it's sustainable and you can say, well, consumers want something that's sustainable, but if it doesn't look good, if it's not hitting those fashion trends, it doesn't matter. They're not going to buy it. They're not going to buy it just because it's sustainable. It has to really look good too. Um, they have to be certain that their supply chains are not compromised. As we touched on earlier, um, it's fine to be able to say, oh, we're using, you know, sustainable materials and we're really doing the right thing. We believe it. But then you find out a kind of, a, you know, a, a break in the chain and suddenly you've got a problem. Um, and they also need to be able to have some kind of a guarantee of the availability of raw materials because part of reliability is also speed. And you can't really have that smooth flowing, stable supply chain if you don't know where your raw materials are coming from or, or when they might get there. And I think that's been pointed out very clearly during COVID. So if we look at what buyers are saying in their own words, and I was not at liberty to use the names of people because most people, as you know, are not allowed to speak on the record <laughs> on behalf of their companies, but I could give you the clue as to where they're from and what kind of a, of a retailer or brand they work for. So, you know, as you, I won't read each one for, you know, one by one by one, because obviously that'll be taking up too much of your valuable time. But I think you can see here that the theme, right, from Europeans particularly are very worried about fraud on certificates. So before people felt, if I have a certificate, all's good, right? Many, many certificates out there. And then they're worried, oh, well, maybe some of those certificates are, are not reliable. Maybe some of them were issued, you know, before, you know, years ago, or no one came back and re-inspected. How do we really know? Uh, people need to know whether the sustainable materials that they're getting are really sustainable, right? A lot of times something is, is what you call greenwashed. So people are concerned about that. Um, people also, you know, price is still an issue. As much as we talk about the fact that people want quality, people want reliability, but brands are still facing price pressure. So they need to be able to find something that's workable, that on the one hand can tick the box on sustainability and on traceability, but that is not hugely beyond what they're paying now. A little bit more, yes, but, you know, wildly more it becomes a problem because ultimately it will boost up the retail price. Um, and I think another thing is that more and more brands are realizing that quality has to be part of their reputation. So, and that means that supply chain that is impeccable. So, you know, again, we're, we're looking for, uh, people are looking for reliable suppliers. They're looking for people who can deliver, who, again, it's not just the cheapest possible price, but who can they really work with? Who can they trust? And I think that all of that is important. The ethical side of things is important. It's important because NGOs are breathing down their neck, but it's also important to their own personal values. So you can see here that whether it be in, the, in um, Europe or in uh, the US, this is a general sentiment that keeps coming back again and again and again. So brands are starting to see quality materials as a competitive advantage, okay? So realistically, brands are saying to themselves, we can, we can see that if we're willing to invest in something that's better quality, we can actually use this as a marketing tool. And they're calling that out, right? 
people are calling that out on a lot of different labeling, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, we also see that consumers believe that natural fibers are better quality. Um, there's no question that if you, if you ask consumers, what do you think is better quality fibers, check the box on that. And I think that also we're seeing that midsize and digital native brands have started to call out materials as a way to differentiate themselves because they can't compete on price, right? With a big brand who's able to do volume and able to get volume pricing. If you're a smaller or mid-size brand, that's not an advantage you have. So you have to go the quality route. And because of that, it's created an awareness, particularly with millennials and Gen Z, who are the primary buyers of a lot of these direct to consumer or digital native brands. So you can see how this is all starting to come together. So looking at what brands are actually doing, because I think that's really important. You know, we can talk about these things and it all sounds good, but it also seems a bit hypothetical or best case scenario. So I wanted to call forward examples of exactly what brands are doing. So in this case, um, this is Uniqlo, right? An incredibly successful brand footprint in, in many, many parts of the world. And this is on their website for Europe because you can see that the prices are in Euro. And you can see right here that they're calling out 100% Pima cotton, not in the fine print, right? Not in the, well, if you click down and look for the product description and if you really, you know, bury down in there. No, right up front there. That's the key selling point, right? And a banner right across the middle, right? Doesn't get any bolder than that. And they're really putting forward, as you can see, an entire collection of garments. Um, and this is this was um, pulled from their website, um, you know, within the last month. So it's not something that they used to do a long time ago. Um, this is actually what they're doing now. And here we go to an A brand. This is a Hong Kong based brand, Giordano, but they're in over 30 countries around the world. And again, this is um, on their global website and they're calling out not only this is a cotton polo shirt, but they're mentioning it's thick, right? It's good quality fabric. So it's not just cotton, it's thick, high quality. Um, you know, they're really bringing you into the quality side of why you should buy this shirt. Um, so again, I think it's a very important point. If we move to the UK um, and we're talking here about Next, um, Next again is calling out 100% cotton shirts and it's got a huge range of 100% cotton shirts, which they're actually flagging at the top of the page. And if you look here, it's not just they believing it, consumers like it, consumer feedback, right? Has favored 100% cotton. You can see in the, in the consumer um, comments, right? Consumers give feedback and the feedback is monitored by an actual outside um, source which is, which is sitting there telling you whether it's real, because as you know, fake reviews are another big issue, right? So you don't know when you see reviews on a website, is this real or no, it was somebody paying somebody to do this, but this is real because they have that little, you know, FIFO on there um, that actually is monitoring. And you can see the comments from April of this year, right? Good fit and looks good, right? Great quality material, right? You can see they're calling that out. Consumers actually are responding to that. And I think that, you know, this is the kind of proof you can see this from the bottom up, what people like, what they're responding to. I think that's a very important thing that um, brands certainly need to take note, but so do suppliers to understand where the market is going. Um, I, I think it's important to touch upon the importance of mid-sized brands. I've mentioned this throughout the presentation, but still we always like to go back to the big brands because obviously big brand, big volume, and everybody's got to keep the factory running. But we can't overlook the aggregate of all these mid-sized brands grouped together and the share of market that they're starting to account for. Um, and the fact that they're gaining more and more traction with consumers, and again, particularly the younger consumers. So, this is not something that we can overlook. We have to keep this in mind and keep thinking about how we can better work with these brands that they need and what requirements we can meet on, on behalf of these people so that we can um, better work with them. I mean, the downside is that they're small. The upside 
is that they have no legacy systems in place. So we're not having to try to work around things that they've been doing for the last 20 years and hard to change. So, you know, good and bad to everything. So the consensus really is that sustainability starts with raw materials. Raw materials make up the biggest part of the garment, right? So if you get your raw materials right, you've solved a major part of the equation in terms of being able to produce a product that's sustainable, that's truly sustainable. Um, natural fibers are naturally more transparent, right? There's, there's less ingredients that go into them. So you know, it's a lot easier for a consumer to see right? A natural fiber is more sustainable. It's a simpler story to tell. And I think that's important because brands want to communicate to consumers and in a way that a consumer will say, yeah, I, I can, I get that. I trust it. Right. Um, so you want a story that's as simple as possible. Um, and I think that we also clearly understand that transparency, not just, not just sustainability, but transparency is no longer an option. It's a must. And natural fibers like U.S. cotton are definitely seen as being higher quality. So increasingly, we're seeing new rules, right? New rules for everything. Online products are, are growing tremendously, but the labeling and all the other stuff going around it is also increasing, right? Countries have taken note of this. And now they're starting to say, you need to have a lot better product labeling. In the old days, uh, anything that was sold online was fair game, right? Now, actually, we're getting a lot more demands coming in for certificate of origin, for uh, materials, for ingredients, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to keep that in mind that that's going to be something we're facing. There's also higher standards for what's considered sustainable, but I wouldn't be surprised if will also be raising that soon as well. So people will want people want to know, right, what is exactly sustainable. They're not going to accept you just saying it. You now have to be able to prove it and that standard for what passes muster is going to be higher. We're also seeing more investigations by NGOs and governments into supply chain. And ethical sourcing obviously is becoming a big concern for brands. We know that we won't make mention of recent cases, but we know that this is obviously um, a major concern. So risky business, obviously buyers, you know, the past almost two years now um, have made everybody very risk averse, even more so than before. And people are starting to realize that if you're only chasing price, wow, that could be a massive problem. So people are starting to think about many other factors that are weighing into that decision. Obviously, you don't want to have customs delays and you don't want social media issues, but also we're seeing that now a growing number of companies are tying executive compensation into reaching corporate sustainability goals. So for any buyers who might be on the fence about whether or not they need to make an effort to up their sustainability factor, they definitely um, are not going to be on the fence when their compensation is tied to it. So that's another thing that, again, is pushing things in the direction of greater sustainability and traceability. Trust really is the key to winning in today's market. And I, I think that if you sit down and think about it, how many times do you think about buying something or you know, utilizing a service, and then mm, you're not really sure, right? You don't really know if what they're telling you is true. You're not really sure if it's the right thing. Uh, people, people nowadays are very skeptical of everything. I mean, you know, the whole fake news kind of thing and fake reviews and fake everything. It's made consumers very, very skeptical. So consumers are really looking for brands that they can trust and believe in. And I think that this is the perfect time for the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol. It's a game changer for brands because it's the exact thing that you need to have, right, to be able to go out, ultimately putting your product at retail, having all these certificates and approvals on it coming from something, wow, U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol. That will resonate with consumers because that's exactly the, the underlying factor that people want. They want to know, 
can I really trust this? So let's help buyers meet the challenge. Here's why I think India is poised to be a winner. And we've been studying this and, and watching what's happening in different nations throughout Asia in terms of supply chain. But I think that in particular, India is really in the right place at the right time. First of all, India can handle small orders. And as we talked about before, you know, the rise of these mid-sized brands, direct to consumer brands, um, digital native brands, they're all running smaller orders, right? A lot of it is, um, you know, manufacturing on demand, a lot of these kind of things that are really, you need to have that ability to do small orders. Another thing is, of course, unique design. And so we're not really talking about design here, but still we know that people more and more want to have that customization, personalization. And India has very strong skills, right? On, on handwork and on all kinds of other ways to make a garment look special. I think that India has, a, has a domestic supply chain. So again, we're talking about speed, we're talking about agility. That's a big advantage that India has over many of its neighbors. Um, you also have growing um, domestic standards, right, for sustainability. And of course you have, and this is also very important, is increased government and private investment in infrastructure, particularly in logistics. So all of these things bode very, very well for India as a supplier to the world, particularly as much of our industry is looking to diversify their supply chain. So being the supplier that brands are looking to work with really means that you need to check the box on transparency, sustainability, but also you can't avoid the fashion side. Um, that's very, very important to be able to, to meet the product development side of things. Um, and then also, are you reliable? Are you flexible? Um, do you have speed? So, wow, that's a lot. You know, that's a huge ask. That's a big ask from the days when it just had to check the box on looks good in shape. But, you know, it's a, it's a challenge, but it also opens up new opportunities. One more thing, I think, that's going to put Indian manufacturers really on the top, and that is using high quality materials. I think if you're using U.S. cotton and you're able to have the U.S. cotton, U.S. cotton USA hang tag, um, that's massive. And then it's backed by the U.S. cotton trust protocol. Now you're taking all the other things that India has in its favor, right? Everything. And now you're saying, oh, and also we have this sustainability traceability factor that's provable, right? Something that's so solid. Um, it's hard to argue with that. I, th I think that that's really positions India way ahead of everybody else. So opportunities for brands and retailers, right? Um, brands and retailers need to clean up any weak links before NGOs get to them. A lot of people were just sort of saying, you know, push it under the carpet, as we say, don't worry about it. Um, but actually you have to worry about it. You have to be ahead of the curve, be there before they find you and then start to create all kinds of havoc um, over social media. Um, also, you know, consu you, consumers want sustainable products. So the more you're able to deliver on that, of course, that's going to give you that competitive advantage. Um, if you're able to take advantage of the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol, right, um, you're ensuring the raw materials that you're using meet the highest standard. You're able to check the box very neatly on sustainability and traceability. And high quality fibers, um, natural fibers, we can see from the previous examples that I showed from what actual brands, big brands are doing, we can see that that's a winner. That's a winner with consumers. So in brief, right, brands and retailers are facing very tough challenges these days. So are suppliers, but you know, we're focusing on brands and retailers right now. Um, you know, they're getting, they're getting investigations from government and NGOs, stuff they never had to cope with before, all of a sudden, part of day-to-day -day life. Um, supply chain, resiliency, right, reliability, all of a sudden. Who thought about this in 2019? All of a sudden, now this is like a, a big thing that everybody has to cope with. Consumers want garments that are durable and have a very soft hand feel. Across the board, whatever they want, that soft hand, that durability, every time you ask consumers what they want, wow top of the list, that's what they want. And I think that, you know, when you look at it, the fiber is not just checking the box on sustainability, 
checking the box on uh, durability, but it's also a marketing tool. So people are calling out when their fibers like Cotton USA, they're calling them out. They're calling out Sapima. And I think that's important. We're looking at that now, not just as an, a raw material, but actually a marketing program. So this is in this big opportunity. So many things are conspiring to help push India forward. Take advantage of the ability to do those small customized orders. Continue to invest in building up speed, reliability, and transparency. And of course, using top quality raw materials, right, that are sustainable, again, positions you as a quality supplier. It's no longer an expense using better quality raw materials. Nowadays, it's actually an investment. So that concludes my presentation. Um, thank you so much for your time. I truly appreciate it. And I wish everybody tremendous success. Thank you, Jaina, for your wonderful presentation. And I think you have very rightly said that using the right raw materials is not an expense. It's really the right investment for the future. I mean, very rightly said. So uh, let's move to uh, our poll question before we begin the Q&A with Jane. So uh, Sumit, if you can please put the poll question. Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, poll question which we have made out from Jane Singer's presentation. So what, according to you, is the major challenge faced by your organization to increase the uptake or the usage of sustainable textile products? Is it the availability of raw materials? Is it the price? Is it acceptability by brand retailers or even the lack of awareness with consumers or you don't foresee any challenge? We'll give a couple of more seconds uh, for our participants to respond. So thank you very much for your response. Uh, so Sumit, if you can please display. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is where we are. So Jane, if you see the results that have come up from uh, yes. our participants, they show that the raw material availability, the price is the first factor. The second <laughs> is the raw, the raw material availability. Third is the lack of awareness with consumers. And then uh, at the last, it's acceptability by brand retailers. So I think this is actually my question to you also. So what is your observation uh, when you see these results? What is your take on, on these responses? And, and this is the real question that I have for you for today's session. So are you are you asking me, Kush? Yes, yes. So how yes, okay. so you agree with them? So do you agree yes. with that participation that this is the real challenge that uh, yes. for the uptake of raw materials? I think it, I think this is absolutely reflects the situation in the market right now. Um, yes, availability is critical, a hundred percent, because people aren't sure what to find and where. Um, price is always a problem. Let's be honest. Have we ever met a buyer who doesn't push on price? I think even if you're talking to a luxury brand, um, everyone's pushing on price and people have a legacy of pushing on price. They'll push on price no matter what, even if they're selling something for a million dollars. But I think that, so, so we have to get over that. But at the same time, before buyers were pushing on price, but we had no way to push back. Now we have a little pushback because yes, 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 they want a cheaper price. But on the other hand, they also don't want to end up with problems because they have supply chain issues um, and sustainability issues and transparency issues. So now we have sort of a tool, right? A weapon, if you want to say it that way, to push back and start to say, hey, wait a second. You know, you go for the cheapest price. Hmm. You may be saving money in the short run, but you may actually end up spending millions of dollars on PR problems, on legal problems. You know, it, it, get, it, you know, it gets ugly. When it gets bad, it gets bad really fast. So I think that price is something that will start to, I don't want to say go away, but I think that it will start to recede a little bit. Raw material availability um, is something that as the demand grows, hopefully so will the supply. So I think, you know, U.S. Cotton has done a fabulous job and any mill I talk to always tells me the reliability of being able not only to get the product, but, but also understanding what's in each bale is huge. 
So I think that that's one thing where at least if you're going with U.S. cotton, you have definitely, I don't want to say 100% solved, but you've gotten a, a very, very close to solving that raw material availability issue. Um, lack of awareness in consumers and so on. I think in younger consumers, it's not really the lack of awareness at this point. With, their, with much, much younger consumers, it's a price issue for them simply because they don't have the money. And so it's not like they have the money, but they're not spending it. A lot of these very young consumers, Gen Z in particular, are either still in school or just got out of school. They don't really don't have a lot of money, but they've been educated, right? They've been indoctrinated in the importance of sustainability. So therefore, they will graduate, right, <laughs> and get jobs. And, and then they make the buying decision, and that's what they're going to go for. So what you're doing now is building up that credential that will serve you well in in maybe two to three years but you know you got to get started in advance yeah that's that's very true and uh, we still have a lot of courses for you jane but i am sorry that we are running short of yeah. time and yeah. we have other speakers to go so once again thank you very much for that wonderful presentation and also showcasing to our participants that how they can take advantage of using us cotton being a member of us cotton test protocol and address to the needs of sustainability for brand and so thank you very much for showcasing this opportunity. And yeah. probably we'll have you soon once again when we do another session. So thank, thank you very you. much, Jane, today. Thank, thank you. you. So uh, before we move to next session, uh, we have another polling question for our participants. So Sumit, if you can please display our next polling question, please. So uh, before we start our next uh, session, uh, so generally speaking, what do you find to be more destructive force in the marketplace? So is it raw material cost prices increases or it is raw material cost decreases? So only two options. It looks simple, but I think uh, we have to give a little more time on this question. So maybe we'll give one minute for this to respond because this is a little, little tricky. Couple of more seconds. Yeah, so that's it. So, Sumit, uh, we can end the poll and uh, let's see the results now. Oh boy. So, it's, uh, it's the raw material price increases, which is more disruptive as compared to raw material cost increases. So, I think then probably people don't mind the prices to go down, but I think when it increases, that is being said to be more disruptive and that is how we are setting up the stage for our next uh, session which is on Supima and uh, so we have two gentlemen from Supima uh, Mr. Mark Lukovic and uh, Jason Thompson uh, you know Mark uh, very well but still I would like to give a brief introduction to you about Mark Mark is the president and CEO of Supima he joined Supima in 2003 Mark began his career in the global cotton industry in 1990 through a family-owned business in Paraguay and has worked as a trader and manager for firms including Conti Cotton, Merrill Lynch, and Itochu Cotton, and Anderson Clayton. The business has taken him from post in Paraguay to Australia, Mexico, and now in the United States. Mark also currently serves as council chair for BCI as an advisor to both executive committee and board for Cotton Council International and also an advisor to the board for U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol. And he will also be joined by his colleague, Jason. Jason is a brand and marketing strategist with extensive background in textile industry. Having served as a director of global sourcing for Cambridge Towel Company, Jason has served the globe, working with every piece of supply chain and build a strong perspective on manufacturing, sourcing, and supply chain excellence. So now, over to you, Mark. Hi, Piyush. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and let me start sharing my screen. I assume everybody can see it and um, you know, thank you all for uh, um, taking your time to be in attendance uh, for this session today. Uh, it's been a, a great opportunity to uh, work uh, closely with the Trust Protocol and uh, Cotton Council International. 
I know many of you, unfortunately, I can't see all of your smiling faces. Uh, hope to be able to be able to do so in uh, the not too distant future and hope uh, that uh, today finds you all safe and well. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, Piyush gave me a, a brief introduction, but my name is Mark Lukowitz, so you can see it's spelled here. For your reference, I'm the president and CEO of Supima, and uh, you can find uh, more information about Supima on our website at supima.com. And uh, before I continue, you know, there has been some great questions already being raised and comments relative to uh, ideas and principles around sustainability. It's a super complicated uh, question and conversation because there are so many influencing factors that uh, affect the conversation around sustainability and responsibility. So I'm going to begin here uh, by talking a little bit in generality about what is sustainability because the term itself is used uh, inappropriately uh, most of the time, it seems, because everybody wants to claim some level of sustainability. The issue is sustainability is not an end game. You can't attain sustainability, right? There is no possible point where you get to the end of the road and say, I'm here and fully sustainable. And the process is an ongoing step-by-step -step improvement such that there's a continual improvement process that allows you to become better and more responsible at doing the things that you do. And in that regard, when we look at uh, what sustainability is as a complex, it covers these three different things, which is the environment, economy, economics issues, and social issues. If we don't address all three, we're not really addressing sustainability. And that's why it can't be a singular conversation, not only relative to a cotton fiber or a process or a step, it has to be a much more holistic response to all the things that are involved and be a much broader view, uh, which is why it's important for having platforms like Cotton Trust Protocol and BCI that are looking at a broader compendium and spectrum of uh, factors that relate to the, the core ingredient that we're talking about today. You know, another way of talking about this is people, a planet and profit. And the reason profit is important is because there has to be an equitable and valuable return through the supply chain, which is, makes the last uh, response to the poll question relative to uh, the concept of price issues really interesting because the response was significantly in the favor of price being a destructor of ability uh, in the question. And conversely, it should be a positive driver because if there's a higher price that empowers the entire supply chain all the way through uh, providing greater resources, greater ability for investment, greater ability to actually support what the end of the supply chain is asking for. If there's a constant price struggle, there is no funding, no resources available to actually deliver on the requests from the brands and retailers. So keep that in mind as we have a conversation and as you talk with your customers relative to the product in the marketplace. So when we talk about the currency of sustainability, there are four key uh, constituent components here. Number one being human capital. It's those that work in the organization, in the industry, you know, in the cotton industry, there's some 30 million people employed within the cotton industry globally. When you look at physical capital, that is the actual hard labor work that is being done, you know, all the way from the farms through the entire supply chain, you know, through uh, the, the businesses, the infrastructure, all of those physical costs that are associated with it. Then we have to remember the intellectual capital, and that is the, the thought process, the, the ideas, the brands, the concepts, the the excitement, the passion, all of that that goes in, you know, that leads then into the emotional capital, which is the, the drivers that actually trigger consumers to buy things, right? And part of that conversation about sustainability is consumerism. So if we talk about sustainability, we also have to talk about consumerism. So there almost has to be a, a switch in terms of the emotional capital that's being invested from just a pure consumptive model into a responsible model where the emotional capital is triggered upon doing the right thing 
in a system that actually tends to be more responsible, which can actually impact the outcomes and impacts of sustainability. So fundamentally, I, I trickle it down to responsibility and accountability, because those are that measurable and actionable things that all of us can do in our jobs with regards to having an impact for sustainability. If there is no responsibility, starting from all the way downstream, all the way upstream, there is no ability to make smart, informed decisions and choices that can actually have those positive outcomes. And that what makes the efforts you know, that we take, you know, Supima, the CCI, the Cotton Trust Protocol, you know, all of these platforms have taken a lot of time and resources and investment, including the growers, to be the most efficient, responsible uh, stewards of the farming processes to deliver not only a durable, responsible, sustainable, available, uh, dependable sources for fiber, which helps the entire supply chain and delivers on continuity for the brands and the consumers. Finally, we need accountability because if there is no accountability, we're left with a continuation of opacity. And that is the emptiness within the supply chain that allows substitution to happen, which allows cheating to happen, which stands by and doesn't hold the supply chain accountable for delivering upon the processes. And that's why price is important because you can't have accountability if price continues to be squeezed, right? Because it's going to break the system it does it every single time we see it year after year. So those are the things that we need to keep in mind when we're talking about sustainability. There was a great article out by in the Harvard Business Review back a, a year ago. Uh, it was written by Kenneth Pucker. Um, and he is somebody that uh, used to work for Under Armour in the sustainability space uh, a long time ago. And you know this is a really interesting article if you uh, have the opportunity to take some time to read it because it talks about how sustainability is being leveraged. So it's no longer a conversation of what real sustainability is, more so of sustainability as a tool for leveraging consumption, which is the antithesis in a way of actual sustainability. So here's four quotes that I just wanted to highlight from within that article. And the first one talks about um, uh, Ivan Chenard, who is the uh, founder of Patagonia, and he lamented in, in the comments that it's all growth, 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 and that's what's destroying the planet. So right from those words, it is an indication that all of this massive growth, this unsustainable growth of looking to a consumer population that isn't growing that quickly, but we are projecting that brands and consumers are going to be able to grow and consume more is part of the problem. So how do we address that in our sustainability conversation? You know, that is something that we have to take a serious look at. You know, then Andy Rubin, who used to be the uh, chief sustainability officer at Walmart and now is the founder of Trove, which is a recycling or uh, reuse program, a used clothing uh, program trying to find homes for you know, lightly used uh, articles of clothing, such that it extends the life of them. He indicates that even in Walmart's uh, spectrum, it was really, really difficult to understand and influence the interconnected supply chain, to have the insight and clarity, to have the conversation that could even begin to start addressing what sustainability is. And then we look at the exaggerations and the consumer bandwidth thing and green wishing issues that arise out of all of these efforts because claims are being made, you know, with mile or milestones or benchmarks of somebody or a brand saying, we will be sustainable by X or we will be X percent sustainable by year so and so. Those are irrational and unreasonable uh, benchmarks because Again, it's not an end game. You don't reach a point where you are just automatically sustainable because you are consuming and your, re your resources that are going into that are not circular. They're just not simply all renewable. All that energy, all the people, all the inputs, all those aspects have been taken out of the system used specifically to create a product 
that was made to be consumed. So those are some of the other issues. And then the real dangers you know, uh, in this last is when almost, ends, almost nothing ends up being done. And that goes into my next slide, which actually shows the data around the claims relative to reporting on initiative standards for sustainability versus the actual impact on CEO missions. So we haven't had an impact. So the issue is that we are making all sorts of claims, which ties back to my point about responsibility. Where is the responsibility? Where is the leadership? And who is going to be the ones that stand up, that take the reins and actually drive this conversation forward? So we applaud the trust protocol for trying to take a much deeper dive into the data, into the facts, and trying to steward a platform that will deliver data not only to the downstream customers, but also deliver data back upstream to the growers, which will help for improvement and then allows the, the brands and retailers also to help decide and determine what are the things that they can do that will help support the supply chain to deliver on more positive outcomes. So this is the key to all of it because it really depends on authenticity. So we talk about sustainability, but if we don't know what the inputs are, what the products are made with, we really don't have any knowledge or information actually about authenticity and therefore we're not responsible. We started a project with Caring Group uh, a few years ago to deliver the first truly organic uh, traceable cotton. And they're using Supima cotton from one organic grower in New Mexico. It's an intensive program that started with real traceability that Gary Bell talked about, and that is the Oratane platform, which uh, uses trace elements in the cotton fiber as it's grown to track and trace the fiber itself all the way through the supply chain. So at any point from the cotton field to the bale, to the yarn, to the fabric, to the finished good, the cotton itself can be tested and the trace elements measured to match that back to the point of origin where it was grown. Now the carrying example is an extreme example because it is a singular farm point of origin. So that shows the, the resolution capability of the platform from Oratane but that is an extreme costly example that takes tremendous amount of resources and a tremendous amount of cost in, through the entire supply chain to facilitate a program. It requires greater inventory levels. It requires greater contracting commitments by the mill with the grower such that they produce more cotton than is needed for the year going forward because they need to ensure that they're actually able to harvest all the cotton they need because mother nature can throw down a hailstorm, rain, heat, all sorts of other issues that can impact production. So in this model, because it's so complicated, the cost for actually executing it have to go up. So sustainability is not cost neutral. There has to be support again, in terms of value and pricing that enables things that are truly responsible to be able to be accomplished. So from Supima's standpoint, we've always been in a bit of a unique position because of our unique landscape of our smaller grower base, the unique fiber species that we're growing. 100% of our cotton is grown from the Gossipian barbadensi species that was bred in Arizona under the American Piman cotton name. It is only grown in four states in California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. It's a small subset of the world's cotton. It's less than a half a percent of the world's cotton today. Production will be down again a little bit later and you'll hear more from Jason on some of the statistical information relative to that. It's all grown here in the US. It's authentic. We have the ability to prove provenance, prove ver uh, uh, with veracity the origin. And it is a superior fiber in that it has unique characteristics that lend itself you know, to greater durability, greater efficiency in the spinning mill. Uh, so it helps reduce costs, energy consumption, and all of those things that are important relative to this conversation. A lot of the Supima cotton is also grown in California, 
which is arguably the most regulated agriculture producing area in the world. We worked together with the California Cotton Engineers and Growers Association and put together a white paper that is over 600 pages long and that is just a list of the regulatory information that they have to comply with, uh, which is uh, can be fineable, it can be uh, imprisonable for violations, and that attains and per, uh, is a requirement and is associated with all of the guidelines and the requirements that they actually have to comply with on an annual basis. So authenticity underlies everything that we try to focus on with Supima. We have a lot of partners in India. If uh, you've been, or if you're on social media at all and watching the uptick of activity in India, there is an incredible amount of small startup brands in India that have found Supima cotton, are creating uh, brands uh, out of Supima for t-shirts and sweaters and all sorts of uh, garments. It is actually at this point now almost impossible for us to keep up with because it is on such an exponential growth curve. So that is really exciting to see that there is an attention and understanding of not only the quality of the cotton, but the responsibility that grows into growing the cotton that is associated with that fiber. So briefly, just to highlight again, we use Oritane for origin verification. You can use Oritane too. It is a platform that is ubiquitous. It's available for all American Pima cotton uh, and is usable for all Supima branded items. As Gary alluded to, it is also, uh, Oritane has also completed a fingerprint for all US cotton. So if you want to have authenticity, you know, to be able to be a provider of authenticity to your customers in the supply chain, feel free to contact Gary or myself or Jason. We'll be happy to talk through this process with you and explain more. Uh, some brands have already engaged in Oritane with some significant testing programs that are multi-year programs. We have other manufacturers that are already engaged. Uh, for example, Cone Denim uh, publicly announced that they are using Oritane for their origin verification for their plat platform. Uh, Albini in Italy is using Oritane. Uh, they're also the partner for the carrying program. And there's many others that are also doing this. So it's not only a brand program, it's a supply chain program. If you want to be a partner that can deliver upon your promise of quality and authenticity, Oritane is a tool that can help you accomplish that and deliver on that promise to your customers. And quite simply, this is how it works. It just uses mother nature. It uses the trace elements that are res resident in the soil, the atmosphere, the water that is used to grow the cotton. Those trace elements are picked up in the plant and distributed into the fiber. And the fiber is sampled by Supima. We collect the samples across the entire farming region for Supima cotton on an annual basis to keep updating the platform. And those fingerprints, those geochemical uh, fingerprints are then analyzed and mapped relative to the physical map locations on, of where the farms are. And that creates the fingerprint that is available for all of our partners to tap into and to utilize you know, to authenticate uh, the cotton that they're using. So with that, uh, that completes my component of uh, the presentation. And uh, I'm happy now to pass it over to Jason, who will uh, be able to uh, continue unless there are some specific questions that somebody has at this point. Fuse, um, are there any questions that we need to answer before we move on to Jason? I think Bob, we can move to Jason and then we have polling question and then we'll take you and your team. Perfect. We can move so to Jason's presentation. We'll move on to Jason. Thank you everybody and great to be with you uh, virtually. All right, thanks, Mark. Can everybody see that okay? Um, we're just gonna go through a few things here on supply and demand. Uh, Mark touched on it a little bit about how there's going to be a little bit of a tight supply situation this year. Well, we can touch on some of the reasons I'm sure that many of the, uh, the attendees are educated on what's going on, um, but just wanted to share a few, a few things here. 
Um, so if you look at the USDA production estimates uh, heading into the new crop year as, uh, and showing the, the two years prior, um, I highlighted the production um, there at 398.4. That's probably pretty much accurate to what we're seeing. Um, some of the mapping out there and, and some of the reports that we're getting back from the, the pest eradication programs. Uh, so 400,000 bales is a marker that we're putting on this year that is significantly down um, from production in years past. And what we're also facing is that exports and demand are up um, compared to years past as well. We had a couple bumper crop years that have allowed us to have some carryover stocks that have, that have backfilled a lot of the, uh, the demand that we saw during the COVID period. Um, we had some price uh, pressures where it was trading far too low, but of course that also stimulated a little bit of export uh, growth, but we also had some situations where ELS cotton and, and more, dare I say, responsibly sourced cotton uh, was becoming really important for brands and retailers. We've talked to that at length. Um, so if you look at the exports that uh, USDA is predi uh, predicted for 20 and 21, it's 744,000. We seem to be on track for that. Uh, as of last week, we had exported about 734,000 um, and we're heading towards the end of the crop year. So that looks to be pretty much accurate. We've got eight, somewhere around 837,000 bales in total sales uh, for this year. Uh, what gets exported, we will see over the, over the next week or so uh, to end of the crop year. And if you look at the ending stocks uh, at 50,000 bales or 57,000 bales, that might even be a little high. Um, we could see a year where this, we are sold out. Um, and we're starting to see the, the effects of that, of course, with the uh, continued raise, uh, rising prices um, and what it's being contracted out at. Uh, Caught look, as of yesterday, had it raised to 210 a pound. We are seeing it, uh, that's far east. Um, grade two, we are seeing it, uh, or have heard that it's being traded at higher rates than that and contracted. Um, so we do know that it's settling somewhere in between that 215, 217, 220 in some cases as well per pound currently. That could continue to rise. Um, you know, 250 is not out of the question at this point, and we'll see where it goes from here. So you look at production. Over the last, uh, you know, few years, uh, you can see the, the difference in the graph at the, at the far right there. Um, you know, this is, this is going to be a, a small crop year. What are the reasons for that? Well, there's, there's a few discerning factors that have led us to that. Um, before we get into it, we'll look at some of the consuming markets. Of course, where is it going? India being the, the number one destination. Um, we, can, we think that will continue. Uh, into this uh, next year. However, uh, China, who has, you know, predominantly been the largest consumer of American Pima cotton under this Pima trademark, uh, will tighten that gap again. Um, and that's going to lead to some more supply pressures. Uh, Vietnam, this year is, is the third uh, largest export country that has overtaken Pakistan. Pakistan generally was the third largest, uh, predominantly over the last few years. We don't see that trend uh, changing. We think Vietnam is actually going to rise. And one of the notable uh, export markets there, of course, is Peru. Uh, Peru is exporting a record number of, uh, uh, importing, excuse me, a record number of Supima bales. It does, Peru always did import more Pima than it grew of its own, but it's can, it has a smaller crop this year and the demand for Pima through the better quality mint mills there has led to a rise in their production as well. So they're on track for some of their largest uh, import numbers. We look at pricing. So if you look to the far right again, that's we're starting to creep up over that $2 mark. Uh, hasn't been over that at phase for a while. We've had large production years. Uh, we've had steady demand. Um, and as you see, just before that rise, that steep rise in price, we were down um, at, a, at quite a low level. We do know that it was trading below that level. I don't think Hotluck ever dropped it below $1.10 or $1.20, but we know it was closer to a dollar um, that it was trading at, maybe even lower in some cases. Uh, that, as we talk about sustainability, 
um, that is a price level that simply cannot be sustained. A dollar or a dollar ten or a dollar twenty is a price that the farmers are losing far too much money. Uh, it is way below the cost of production and they will not plant it or grow it at that rate. And we've seen the reaction already to that because a lot of what we're seeing with this shorter crop year is water availability, but also the fact that because there was so much money lost last year that farmers are just choosing not to plant it. Um, they are seeing a better price increase this year. So perhaps there's some farms that come back next year, but once a farm decides to get out of cotton, they're reluctant to get back in. So we do see that it's going to be some tight supply over the next couple of years. Uh, we don't see a lot of farms coming back, maybe a handful of them um, coming back into production when they see the raised uh, prices. And we, we are seeing a change here to what the level of production might be for, for American Pima and where we might be at. This is also a factor. So of course we had the, uh, one of the biggest uh, factors to lower prices was the trade war with China. If you see that production number in 219, the blue, the, the dark blue is where they ended. Um, the light blue is year to date. So if you look at where we're at from this year, year to date, we're creeping back up towards those 2017, 2018 levels. There's only about 50 or 60,000 bale difference at this point between where we're at now and 2018. So that's going to narrow the gap on the consumption from India, and it's also going to provide um, a little bit more of supply pressure as China comes back online because they continue to import uh, Sapima. It is continuously one of their, their best premium quality export products. So we don't see that trend slowing down. Um, there was a lot of availability at the start of, of 2020 simply because China wasn't buying. So that led to some lower pricing as well as merchants tried to you know, ship bales as fast as they could or get some cash flow in. So that kind of year, we're not gonna have again. Um, we don't see it for the foreseeable future. And we have a drought uh, on top of everything. So water availability is going to be very tough, especially in the West this year. Basically all of our production areas are in severe water crisis at the moment. Um, so water availability has led to uh, acreage being down. Um, and we'll see what happens when we, uh, when we actually get some harvest numbers and we start the harvest in October. Um, this of course leads into some of the water conversation around cotton and we're quick to point out to brands, retailers, and when we're doing information sessions that despite what is being said in marketing materials uh, that brands and retailers put forward about cotton being a thirsty crop, it really doesn't move the needle one way or another. What is actually affecting this is the other crops that are permanent that water needs to be distributed to before the farmer will choose to plant a rotational and allocate their water to that. Which again leads us back to if they are going to plant more and we need more Pima, then it has to be at a price that is gonna return a profit to the grower so that their water costs don't leave them dry for putting a rotation in that they lose money on. So that's what's really affecting it when we talk about water. It's not that cotton uses a lot of water, it's that there are permanent crops that need to be taken care of. There are crops above cotton that need to be taken care of that return more profit at this point before they will plant the rotation. And whatever water is left over, then they will use it towards the cotton. So leading into the impact that this has had on Sapima, we've actually seen a steady year. Uh, it was a little, precarious heading into the uh, the COVID situation as to where things were going to go. But we actually, this is as of last month when we did our licensing update for our annual meetings. Um, our licensees were 539. They have climbed a little bit higher since then uh, towards the 550 mark. Uh, 187 brands and retailers. Um, we brought on Hugo Boss, Madewell, Ralph Lauren. We've seen a complete uptick in the amount of uh, messaging around Sapima, the usage of the, of the trademark worldwide. Uh, 50 countries use uh, the Sapima trademark at the consumer level. Um, so when we look at the numbers, we actually had uh, a very strong year as far as applications for licensing, new applications for licensing and the continuing um, renewals of licensing. So it's actually shows the, the demand for identity cotton, the demand for an authentic 
uh, cotton in a trademark that has trust and uh, premium, uh, you know, premium stories behind it. So where is it being used? Well, all over the place. This is an American uh, company called American Giant that produces only in America. So they have the made in America story from seed to stitch. Uh, they saw a, an increase in their subpoena use and also their subpoena consumption at the consumer level. So they leaned into more stories, uh, brought on new t-shirt programs and started messaging subpoena a lot more as well. Uh, this is James Purse, another premium, um, as, as Jane would point out, uh, mid-level uh, consumer brand uh, that is uh, continuing to push premium price points and simple storytelling around premium products. And we'll talk about sustainability a lot. Um, they simply say they make good stuff and they sell it for a good price. Um, and they continue to have uh, strong, strong reports. Rod and Gun is uh, you know, a company that works with Albini. Um, they're out of New Zealand and in the Australian market. Um, so they use Supima with their fine shirting fabrics. Um, they are looking towards more storytelling with the supply chain, more storytelling with uh, Supima in general. Uh, Napa Idri, uh, which I always say wrong, um, has leaned into Supima with some of their premium knitwear. Uh, this is BF company that, that works with them um, in Europe primarily. So simple messaging here, gentler on the earth, uh, with you for longer, and that it has authentic um, origin identification. So again, the this tenants of Supima are put on display here, which is that it's it's going to be more durable, it's going to look better, and it's going to last longer, which you could point to being quote unquote sustainable. Um, when you look at Brooks Brothers, they've been a long supporter of Supima. That has not changed. Uh, this was their summer, spring summer program that was their landing splash page on their on their website, and I think it continues to be. Um, so again, softer, brighter, stronger. The messaging continues. Uh, this is this is what sells Supima. Um, we do have a lot that we can get into as far as the practices and where it comes from, but make no mistake, the consumer still keys on these things when it comes to Supima, and this is what's selling it across the board. Uh, Good Life, company out of, uh, out of the States, uh, does a Supima modal and a Supima fabric, uh, still their top sellers. Ferrari has looked into uh, now calling out their cottons and doing different kind of garments with Supima, um, so uh, at a premium level to go with your premium car. We have lots of home textile stories. The home textile industry has obviously seen uh, quite a strong performance year with uh, COVID and people turning back into the home. So everything from seed to stitch made in the US to the Four Seasons, uh, now turning away from Egyptian and, and using Supima for their sheet sets. Um, Standard Textile launched into the uh, consumer market. They're primarily a hospitality maker. They've decided to go uh, direct to consumer with their own brand. Um, they also own the Massioni brand out of Italy, and they're taking that to the U.S. consumer using Supima products as well. And Pure Care is a company out of Arizona. Um, they do different sheet sets, but they actually have their Supima sheet set certified by the National Sleep Foundation, and it is the only National Sleep Foundation certified sheet set uh, on the market, from what I'm told. Um, Costco. Uh, has has turned to Supima for their higher end 800 uh, TC program, and I'm going to finish with this slide because it points to something that we didn't see coming and we haven't seen before. This was in June. Um, Uniqlo, obviously, the Supima cotton T-shirt that Jane put up, and their messaging behind it um, is one of the largest programs using Supima and is also one of the biggest drivers for Uniqlo. Um, they were out of stock in June. Um, this is a combination of demand and supply chain and what we're seeing. Uh, we have not seen this before uh, when you landed on their page. And when Pius put up the poll question about raw material cost increases and decreases being destructive in the marketplace, it was a really interesting uh, question to take a little bit of time on because when you look at Uniqlo and you look at the messaging that Jane showed earlier, and what they're doing. It is, you can't not note the fact that Uniqlo has increased the price of this t-shirt by 50%, right? 
the price of the t-shirt went up 50% and they're still selling the same amount, if not more, right, uh, of this t-shirt. So the price pressures that we talk about, this, this system of pricing, 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 is antithetical to the sustainability messaging or the authenticity or responsible sourcing. If you are constantly pushing down price and it's growth, it's low cost, high growth, low cost, high growth, low cost, high growth, then you are simply doing the same old and you are not participating in a sustainable or authentic supply chain, right? And we have seen that the marketplace and the consumer can absorb price increases. This is a perfect example of that, all right? So, this program you would have thought was going to live at $9.99 for the shirt, you know, for its lifetime. It is now $14.99, right? And we've seen the price increase in Euro in, in the Euros and across the board as well. Will it go up from there? Perhaps, depending on where the market goes. But they can absorb these pricing and we can look at a different model for sourcing, right? And this is a great example of that. So authenticity is where we come back around to. Um, our messaging will continue to be built around the framework of, of authenticity and, and truth. Uh, coming out of this pandemic year, we you know we we aim to reconnect and re-educate existing licensees, uh, as well as you know make sure that we're we're arming our new ones with the right you know information that they need. Um, new and emerging brands in that you know mid-tier section, the B to the B to C, the direct to consumer, all these sort of brands, you know they. They are really where Supima plays the best. Um, so we're going to continue to have our focus on that. And, you know, we're, we're constantly doing as much education around the division in the marketplace that exists around the cotton. You know, cotton should not be a this versus that because you can't really do this versus that with cotton. Um, it's far too nuanced and far too complex. Uh, you need to make your own decisions as a brand and retailer and as a manufacturer as to what you're going to you know, present when you use your raw materials, but simply doing a this versus that by using branding or, or arbitrary things like organic uh, isn't really going to help the marketplace. It's actually, you know, you could make an argument that that's going to hurt it. Um, so that's all I have. I'll stop sharing my screen at this point. And, you know, if there's any questions or anything that you need from us, uh, Piyush, I'm happy to talk. Uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, that was an amazing presentation. Uh, especially, uh, you know, in the normal world, we wouldn't have ever expected that you increase the prices by 50% and you go out of stock. I mean, that's like, you know, never imagined. Uh, so, uh, and the other thing is, uh, India is still at 36% in terms of the share for Supima, right? And uh, so, uh, I think before we move to question and answer session, uh, we have uh, some whole courses to come up with, and uh, one of those is actually related to Mark's uh, presentation where he was actually asking that, you know, uh, sustainability can't be cost neutral. Let's also hear that from our respondents, what they believe in. So, uh, Sumit, if we can put up our first whole question, please. So, yes, here we are. So, how much does sustainability add in terms of cost to your production? Is it less than 2%, 3 to 5%, 6 to 10%? 11 to 25 percent or more than 26 percent. We'll give a couple of seconds to respond. So. Okay, so with this, we end this polling question and uh, let's see, what do we have? So, so what we have with us is, I mean, more than 75% is, you know, more than six to seven, six to 10 percent cost. And majority of that lies within 11 to 25 percent. So does that gel with Mark your analysis? What your analysis is more or less in terms of the cost to sustainability? Yeah, that was uh, a, a, you know an interesting um, feedback because it was higher than I expected 
uh, the answers would be. So um, it is just a function of the complexity of trying to build in responsibility into the supply chain. You're trying to build out uh, a model that delivers upon known ingredients, known product uh, inventory that can support the delivery of those programs is something that just adds costs. So it is, is a good uh, conversation to have, especially with regards to the downstream customers. So when we're talking with the buyers of those products, you know, there has to be a clear communication that there is a cost that comes with, you know, the requests and the expectations, but then it also has to be um, presented uh, correspondingly to the consumer such that they understand that it's just not something that magically happens. So thanks, Mark. And I think the next question will be pretty easier uh, after hearing this. And uh, let's put the next question, please. Can sustainability be offered at a cost neutral basis? Yes or no? Yeah, so, uh, so Sumit, if we can also showcase the results here. <laughs> I think this is, uh, this is. Well, it's like the opposite yeah. of the last one. It is the opposite of what we received before, right? I mean, I think, the, I mean, you always accept, expect that the sustainability can be offered at a cost in different places, but what you are experiencing now is very different. So does it mean that this is expectation of the audience? <laughs> so the, 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 you know, the facts around the matter is when we're asking the growers to invest more, right? Whether it has to do with irrigation management, pest management, land management, soil erosion management, um, you know, all those other practices that can impact, you know, rotation for crops and things. Uh, those are things that just don't happen for free. It is, uh, it's an impossibility to ask that from the grower community. Similarly, if there's a, a request for changing of chemical processes or uh, processing at the, at the plant, often that comes with an investment in infrastructure, you know, new machinery, new equipment, new efficiency, replacement of older machinery with new equipment. Again, none of that is cost neutral uh, or cost efficient. So it would be an interesting conversation to take forward, especially with those on the cost neutral expectation of why it is or how it is that there would be uh, a capability of introducing more practical and responsible practices that are perceived that could be done on a cost neutral basis. Because we see one comment uh... Uh, they say that the comment that has come up is that the expectation from the brand retailer is that sustainability has to be possible. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to the next question. Uh, so I think we have last two questions to go for the poll and uh, so submit if uh, we can have uh, the next question. So yeah, this is really interesting. Is there enough industry and customer support to provide opportunities for investment in more responsible processes to lead towards sustainable outcomes? Yes or no? Okay, so Sumit, let's uh, see the results. Any comments, Jason, Mark, on this? Or, Again, very, uh, very <laughs> curious, considering the last response because it's cost neutral, but yet they're saying that there's enough support, which we mean also financial support, which would enable the investments in the processing towards more sustainable outcomes. 
so again, a, a bit of a conundrum between the, the two responses. Uh, very curious and you know certainly one worth you know trying to dive into a little further. So let's see the final question now. Yeah, this is interesting again. Now, what impact has the increase in raw material prices had on your business, positive or negative? And I will request the respondents to be <laughs> really honest on this one. So that's it, Sumit. So if you can uh, display the results of this final question for all of us. Hmm. Yeah, and and you know that that is an expected response, right? The the yeah. the idea that you know the neg the the cost of input materials and changes and challenges are one that would actually have a. Um, a limit limiting effect on the ability to sell products, you know, because of the existing price pressure. But again, it all stems around price. So if you expect that price can't move, then yes, increase of inputs will have a negative impact. But the assumption or expectation that price can't move is is a, is a non equitable uh, solution, uh, especially with the expectations that are. Uh, coming through the supply chain for delivering upon, you know, better promises to the customer. Uh, thanks, Mark. I think uh, we are, uh, you know, coming very close to the session and I don't see, we have, uh, you know, many questions that are uh, left unresponded until now. But I will still want to ask you one question. Uh, how do you think India as a market for Supima in, you know, next few years, it has been a strong market for you for the last few years, like 30% to 36%. How do you see Indian market? So you see demand coming more from home textiles or more from apparels, more from yarns. So what do you see the, the real demand coming in for us? That's a really uh, interesting question, uh, Piyush. And I, I don't know if I have a specific answer for it because I think it's a very complicated framework when we look globally. I, I certainly think there's an opportunity for export of yarns. So I wouldn't dismiss that opportunity. Um, especially with the, the conundrum that we're facing right now with China and the issues about Xinjiang uh, as a complicating factor. The, the home textile business is one that's continuously challenged, again, especially here in the US because the home textile market is one that has been given away, uh, so to speak, in terms of price points. The, the value of goods here in the US is exceptionally low relative to the, the size of the businesses that is being done, the investment that has to be made, um, you can see sheet sets that are being sold for $50. That's five, six pounds of cotton in a sheet set that is spun in fine count yarns, woven in high uh, capacity machines uh, that are expensive in massive mills with a lot of inputs and materials and resources and it's just, it's just volume churn. So they're, they're throwing everything into the system of giving things away. The, and, and yet conversely, you see high quality products that are being sold at high price points you know, and, and doing marginally well. And when I say higher price points, that could even be $200 at this point for a sheet set, which is, is, is kind of crazy. Or you, we see sheet sets that are being made in China that are being made with the same process, the same fabric, the same cotton, sold here in the US for $99, but in China, they're sold for $300. And it has to, has to do entirely with the brand position, you know, the, the, the presentation of what quality means, you know, the responsible messaging that comes with it. So it's, it's, not, it's not just a, a black or white issue. It has to come with a lot more education, especially with the consumers and you know 
part of this whole conversation relative to the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol, what Supima does is really about delivering back more data and more education. Uh, I think, Mark, before we end the session, we have time for two very important questions. One of that is coming from uh, Wellspan, and they're asking, there is an 11% duty which has been imposed on the imports in India now on the cotton since February 21. So is Supreme Association raising any of this issue and or asking for a waiver? Uh, for the import duties? Yes, so, so uh, the National Cotton Council, along with Supima, has already submitted a, a, a request letter uh, to the Indian government uh, specifically addressing uh, ELS cotton. And the issue with ELS cotton being uh, relatively unique in regards to uh, cotton production in China, as it not being a competitive uh, a matter. So we are actively trying to support uh, our partners in India to address uh, this matter and hopefully there is a positive resolution. Um, you know, we're, we're asking as a, as a subset of our larger conversation. Uh, so it, it is one of the challenges, you know, I don't know if they want, if the Indian government will want to make an exception, but any support that we can also get from the local Indian uh, industries and associations to raise this matter in conjunction with what we've done, uh, I'm sure Piyush would be happy to be able to coordinate and share what we've already submitted. Um, so yeah. yes, um, anything that we can do to support you, uh, please feel free to reach out to me and we're happy to do so. Uh, thanks, Mark. And uh, this is now actually leading to our final question today. And this is uh, with auditing. Supima with auditing traceability comes with a cost. Any other things, retailers? Need to know about Supima traceability. Jason, you want to take that one? <laughs> well, any other thing retailers need to know about it, brands and retailers. Um, it's, an about. it's an education um, standpoint that it's, it's not going to come for free, right? So yes, the fiber is uh, traceable to its origin. It can be verified to its origin. Supima provides the platform, meaning that we map and we update the database every single year. So same as US Cotton does, we have the fingerprint available. If the brand and retailer wants to use it, then they have to engage with Oritane and they have to do a supply chain risk mitigation. So Oritane is gonna look at their supply chain it's going to uh, then assess the product from um, you know, spinning to milling, all those sort of things. And it's going to provide you with a, a custom testing protocol that will be statistically relevant, meaning this is how many tests we need to do. These are the stages that we need to collect the samples from, and this will return a, uh, a relevant amount of testing so that you can be confident in the results that you're getting. Right now, that comes at a cost with Oritane um, because you need to access the fingerprint um, that we're providing to be able to do that and verify it back against. So it's not a built in, you get it all for nothing kind of system. Right. And that's what we're trying to, to put forward these days is that, you know, it's impossible for it to be cost neutral. Right. I, I don't understand that that reasoning that we can keep stripping cost out of it, right? Like to my point, at a dollar, with uh, cotton trading at a dollar, because it always gets squeezed back onto the farmer because there's nowhere else to squeeze it back from there, is there? Right? Once you start cutting costs and cutting costs, the the last point of cost cutting is at the farm level, right? When it was trading at a dollar, it was 50 cents, to 40 to 50 cents below the cost of production. Is anybody here going to do something at 40 to 50 cents below the cost of production in their mill? So why do we think that the farmer should be planting it and harvesting it at that rate in order to appease a system um, that everything needs to be given away for the cost of nothing, right? So these are, the, these are the conversations that are difficult to have, but it's conversations that you have to have, right? So it does begin with the raw material sourcing. It does begin with pricing. Um, and what is the relative cost that's going to be, going to sustain the farmers to be able to grow the crop, 
because if we don't have it, then we don't have anything. Right? Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's my, my soapbox moment on it. But for Oratane, um, really, it's just educating the brands and retailers on what the system entails and how they can engage with it. Um, and that it's going to, it's going to, you know, incur some costs and it's going to take some time. Um, to Mark's point on Oratane as well, there are a lot of brands that are currently using it. However, they're using it under a NDA or a restrictive, you know, they're not talking about it. And the reason that they're not talking about it is because it's actually going to find issues if they, if they are in your supply chain, which the brands don't want to talk about. So when we talk about transparency, um, they're, they're doing it, but they're not talking about it, right? Yeah. In some cases, which would be antithetical to transparency. So, you know, we continue to, we continue to, to push and we continue to strive to, uh, to clear the, the mud as, as much as we can. I think that's the, that's the reason we have kept the name of our topic today. Is they are, it is transforming the textile supply chain. The transparency is transforming the textile supply chain. So this is evolving, right? And we'll keep on evolving. Yeah. I think we still have a couple of questions still coming in, but uh, since we are running out of time now, and if we have something which is left unresponded, uh, we will come back uh, by email uh, to the unresponded person. So thank you, Jason, very much. I know it's very early for you, probably you guys have woke up at 3, 3 a.m. today. Thanks, Mark, for being with us. And with this, uh, we will end our session today. We are very thankful to all the speakers uh, to join today. And we are very thankful to our partner, Fiber to Fashion, to host this jointly with Cotton Person International. And hopefully, uh, you know, we can do this again for uh, our industries as well. So once again, thank you very much and uh, stay safe. So signing off, take care, cheers guys. And thanks to our participants.